Chapter Twelve of Harding's Luck. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Estenson. Harding's Luck by Edith Nesbitt. Chapter Twelve. The End. What a triumph for little lame Dicky of Deptford! You think perhaps that he was happy as well as proud for proud he certainly was with those words and those cheers ringing in his ears he had just done the best he could and tried to help beale and the dogs and the man who had thought himself to be lord arden had said i am proud that he should be the head of our house and all the arden folk had cheered it was worth having lived for the unselfish kindness and affection of the man he had displaced the love of his little cousins the devotion of beale the fact that he was lord of arden and would soon be lord of all the old acres the knowledge that now he would learn all he chose to learn and hold in his hand some of the destinies of these village folk all loyal to the name of arden the thought of all that he could be and do all these things you think should have made him happy they would have made him happy but for one thing all this was won at the expense of those whom he loved best the children who were his dear cousins and playfellows the man their father who had moved heaven and earth to establish dicky's claim to the title and had been content quietly to stand aside and give up the title castle lands and treasure to the little cripple from deptford dickie thought of that and almost only of that in the days that followed the life he had led in that dream world when james i was king seemed to him now a very little thing compared with the present glory of being the head of the house of arden of being the providence the loving overlord of all these good peasant folk who loved his name yet the thought of those days when he was plain richard arden son of sir richard arden living in that beautiful house at deptford fretted at all his joy in his present state that and the thought of all he owed to him who had been lord of arden until he came with his lame foot and his airship fretted his soul as rust frets steel these people had received him loved him and been kind to him when he was only a tramp boy and he was repaying them by taking away from them priceless possessions for so he esteemed the lordship of arden and the old lands and the old castle suppose he gave them up the priceless possessions suppose he went away to that sure retreat that was still left of him the past it was almost a sacrifice to give up the here and now for the far off the almost forgotten all that happy other life that had once held all for which he cared seemed thin and dreamlike beside the vivid glories of the life here and now yet he remembered how once that life in king james's time had seemed the best thing in the world and how he had chosen to come back from it to help a helpless middle-aged ne'er-do-weel of a tramp beale well he had helped beale he had done what he had set out to do for beale's sake he had given up the beautiful life for the sordid life and beale was a new man a man that dicky had made surely now he could give up one beautiful life for another for the sake of these his flesh and blood who had so readily so kindly so generously set him in the place that had been theirs more and more it came home to dicky that this was what he had to do to go back to the times when james i was king and never to return to these times at all it would be very bitter 
it would be like leaving home never to return it was exile well was richard lord arden to be afraid of exile or of anything else he must not just disappear either or they would search and search for him and never know that he was gone for ever he must slip away and let the father of edred and elfrida be as he had been lord arden he must make it appear that he richard lord arden was dead he thought over this carefully but if he seemed to be dead edred and elfrida would be very unhappy well they should not be unhappy he would tell them and then they would know that he had behaved well and as an arden should don't be hard on him for longing for just this little human praise there are few of us who can do without it who can bear not to let some one very near and dear know that we have behaved rather decently on those occasions when that is what we have done it took dickie a long time to think out all this clearly and with no mistakes but at last his mind was made up and then he asked edred and elfrida to come up to the cave with him because he had something to tell them when they were all there sitting on the smooth sand by the underground stream dickie said look here i'm not going on being lord arden you can't help it said edred yes i can you know how i went and lived in king james's time well i'm going there again for good you shan't said elfrida i'll tell father i've thought of all that said dickie and i'm going to ask the mouldiwarps to make it so that you can't tell and i can't stay here and feel that i'm turning you and your father out and think what edred did for me in this very cave no my mind's made up it was and they could not shake it but we shan't ever see you again dickie admitted that this was so and oh dickie said elfrida with deep concern you won't ever see us again either think of that whatever will you do without us that said dickie won't be so bad as you think the elfrida and edred who live in those times are as like you as two pins no they aren't really oh don't make it any harder i've got to do it there was that in his voice which silenced and convinced them they felt that he had indeed to do it i could never be happy here never he went on but i shall be happy there and you'll never forget me though there are one or two things i want you to forget and i'm going now oh not now wait and think elfrida implored i've thought of nothing else for a month said dickie and began to lay out the moon seeds on the smooth sand now he said when the pattern was complete i shall hold tinkler and the white seal in my hand and take them with me when i've gone you can put the moon seeds in your pocket and go home when they ask you where i am say i am in the cave they will come and find my clothes and they'll think i was bathing and got drowned i can't bear it said elfrida bursting into sobs i can't and i won't i shan't be really dead silly richard told her we're bound to meet again some day people who love each other can't help meeting again old nurse told me so and she knows everything good-bye elfrida he kissed her good-bye edred old chap i'd like to kiss you too if you don't mind i know boys don't but in the times I'm going, men kiss each other. Raleigh and Drake did, you know. The boys kissed shyly and awkwardly. And now, good-bye, said Richard, and stepped inside the crossed triangles of moon seeds. I wish, he said slowly, O oh, dear Mouldwarps of Arden, grant me these last wishes. I wish Edred and Elfrida may never be able to tell what I have done. And I wish that in a year 
they may forget what I have done, and let them not be unhappy about me, because I shall be very happy. I know I shall, he added doubtfully, and paused. Oh, Dicky, don't, the other children cried out together. He went on. I wish my uncle may restore the castle and take care of the poor people so there aren't any more poor people, and everyone's comfortable, just as I meant to do. He took off his cap and coat and flung them outside the circle, his boots too. I wish I may go back to James the First's time and live out my life there and do honor in my life and death to the house of Arden. The children blinked. Dickie and Tinkler and the white seal were gone, and only the empty ring of moon seeds lay on the sand. Shocking bathing fatality, the newspapers said. Lord Arden drowned, the body not yet recovered. It never was recovered, of course. Elfrida and Edred said nothing. No wonder, their elders said, the shock was too great and too sudden. The father of Edred and Elfrida is Lord Arden now. He has done all that Dickie would have. He has made Arden the happiest and most prosperous village in England, and the stream beside which Dickie bade farewell to his cousins flows. A broad moat round the waters of the castle, restored now to all its own splendor. There's a tablet in the church which tells of the death by drowning of Richard, 16th Lord Arden. The children read it every Sunday for a year, and knew that it did not tell the truth. But by the time the moon seeds had grown and flowered and shed their seeds in the castle garden, they ceased to know this, and talked often, sadly and fondly, of dear cousin Dickie who was drowned. At the same time they ceased to remember that they had ever been out of their own time into the past, so that if they were to read this book they would think it all nonsense and make-up, and not in the least recognize the story as their own. But whatever else is forgotten, Dickie is remembered, and he who gave up his life here for the sake of those he loved will live as long as life shall beat in the hearts of those who loved him. And Dickie himself, I see him in his ruff and cloak, with his little sword by his side, living out the life he has chosen in the old England when James I was king. I see him growing in grace and favor, versed in book learning, expert in all noble sports and exercises, for Dickie is not lame now. I see the roots of his being taking fast hold of his chosen life, and the life that he renounced receding, receding till he can hardly see it any more. I see him, a tall youth, straight and strong, lending the old nurse his arm to walk in the trim, beautiful garden at Deptford and I hear him say, When I was a little boy, nurse, I had mighty strange dreams of another life than this. Forget them, she says. Dreams go to the making of all proper men. But now thou art a man. Forget the dreams of thy childhood, and play the man to the glory of God and of the house of Arden and let thy dreams be of the life to come, compared to which all lives on earth are only dreams. And in that life all those who have loved shall meet and be together forevermore. In that life when all the dear and noble dreams of the earthly life shall at last and forever be something more than dreams. The end. End of chapter twelve. Recording by Sandra Estenson. End of Harding's Luck by Edith Nesbitt.